Welcome to my channel, I'm Scott, and in this video I am going to walk you through the process of valuing Healthier Choices stock by analyzing their financial statements and dissecting their financial ratios so we can determine if it's a buy or a sell. Healthier Choices has patents on vaping technology and imitation nicotine. It also owns grocery stores and vape stores. The company is headquartered in Hollywood, Florida and was founded in 1985. It owns and operates Ada's Natural Market, an 18,000 square foot full service grocery store in Fort Myers, Florida and three Paradise Health and Nutrition locations in Melbourne, Florida. The stores sell all natural and organic products with traditional grocery items complete with frozen foods, vitamins and supplements, health and beauty, fresh produce, meat and bulk foods. Ada's also has an organic juice and smoothie bar, a coffee bar and a fast casual in-store restaurant. It has seven vape stores in the southeastern part of the U.S. It offers smokers an alternative to traditional cigarettes. Its stores are named the Vape Store, Vapor Max, and the Grab Bag. The stores provide an endless selection of vaping hardware and e-liquids. It allows consumers a way to get their nicotine without the smoke, tar, ash, or carbon monoxide found in traditional cigarettes. It has recently invented the Q-Cup which allows you to vape off of the quartz glass and not off the metal coil or ceramic chamber. The company has gained massive popularity since it has started its landmark patent infringement lawsuit against billion dollar conglomerate Philip Morris. The lawsuit is in connection with Philip Morris's product known and marketed as IQOS. IQOS is an alternative tobacco product. Philip Morris claims that it is approaching 14 million users of its IQOS product and has reportedly invested over $3 billion in their smokeless tobacco products. The Philip Morris IQOS is currently the subject of two other patent infringement proceedings filed by R.J. Reynolds Tobacco Company. R.J. Reynolds patents are unrelated and not affiliated with the patents in the HCMC case. Philip Morris subsequently filed a petition with the Patent Trial and Appeal Board of the U.S. Patent and Trademark Office, seeking to invalidate HCMC's U.S. Patent Number 10561170. It appears Philip Morris is fighting fire with fire. Philip Morris can crush HCMC like an ant. People have mentioned on social media that HCMC may receive $1 billion from Philip Morris. HCMC's market cap is $340 million. So if those numbers are accurate, which I can assure you they are not, let's assume it is accurate that Philip Morris may pay $1 billion to HCMC. It would be far cheaper for Philip Morris to buy all of HCMC's shares. Then it can just shut down the company and not sue itself. Just something to consider when you read all this hype. The company recently did a rights offering which gives current shareholders the right to buy stock at a discounted price. Companies do this to raise capital but it does dilute the shareholders. HCMC raised $27 million from this rights offering. Let's get started with the model. This is a small cap company, 339 million market cap. They're trading at 0.0011 cents a share. So you could buy 909 shares for $1 and they have 308 billion shares outstanding. Some people are saying, can this stock go to $1 a share? I promise you it cannot go to $1 a share. Because if it did, it would be worth over $300 billion, making it the 23rd largest company in the United States. Let's look at their financials. The way you value a company is you estimate the free cash flows into the future and then you discount those numbers back to today's value. That's what we're doing in this video. And free cash flow is cash flow from operations minus capital expenditures. So you can see they have negative free cash flow each year since their revenue is pretty low. Also negative net income every year. Net income is the profit or loss on the income statement. It's revenue minus expenses. And their revenue is pretty low. It's 15 million in 2018 down to 13 million in trailing 12 months. This is the company's income statement. The top line is the revenue of the sales. Below that is the cost of revenue. These are the expenses directly related to generating the revenue. Revenue minus cost of revenue gives you your gross profit. And their gross profit is positive each year, but decreasing. Below that is operating expenses, and their operating expenses are higher than their gross profit, so they have negative operating income each year. Below that is the interest they pay in their debt, and they paid the most interest in the trailing 12 months at 330000 
And the bottom line of the income statement is their net income, which of course is negative every year. This is a breakdown of their revenue from their annual report. This is their annual revenue in 2020 and 2019. A bulk of their sales come from the grocery store. They also had 2.5 million in vapor sales. And their vapor sales are down a lot from 2019. Their grocery sales are up a little from 2019. This is the company's statement of cash flows. The top line is operating cash flow. That's how much cash the company loses from its operational business. You could think of operating cash flow as net income converted to cash. Because net income is your accounting profit and loss. It's not actual cash. So you can see they lose money each year from their operational business. They also have capital expenditures, which are investments in property, plant, and equipment. They spent $245,000 in CapEx in 2018. So if they wanted to open up a new grocery store and it cost them $200,000 for the property, that entire $200,000 would go into CapEx the year they got the property. Then they would carry it on their balance sheet and depreciate it over time onto the income statement. So maybe 10% of the $200,000 would be put onto the income statement each year. So the company would pass through $20,000 of expenses onto the income statement each year for 10 years. Operating cash flow minus CapEx gives you your free cash flow and they have negative free cash flow each year. So they use debt to fund their operations. They issued over $3 million in 2018 and $3.4 million in 2020. They also received $27 million from the rights offering which aren't part of these financials because these financials are as of 331. The rights offering was more recently. Let's look at the capital structure. They have $8 million of equity, $5 million of debt. They're 61% equity, 39% debt. And their net debt is negative 300,000. So they could pay off all the debt with the cash on their balance sheet and still have $300,000 of cash left over. Their weighted average cost of capital, which is a blend of the cost of equity and debt, is 13%. And that's a discount rate we're going to apply to the future cash flows. We estimated four years of future free cash flows. We also estimated a terminal value, which is all cash flows past year four. That's 98 million. We discounted those numbers back to today using the weighted average cost of capital. We get a value of the company of $67 million. We divide that by 308 billion shares. And we get a calculated stock price of 0.0002 cents a share. They're trading at 0.0011 cents a share. So they're trading at a 403% premium. It's a sell according to the model. It's really hard to value this company because I don't know how much they're going to grow and if they're ever going to get positive free cash flow at some point. But I just made it easy. I assume they would have about $100 million in revenue in 2024 and they would convert 10% of that to free cash flow. So they would have $10 million of free cash flow that year. And I'm still coming up with a stock price a lot lower than they're trading at. I don't think they're going to have that much revenue by 2024, but even in the most aggressive case, I'm still coming up with a stock price a lot lower than a trading at. I know most people are not looking at the fundamentals of this company. They just look at the hype of the company and this possible lawsuit with Philip Morris, a possible short squeeze. So they're just trading on momentum, which is fine to do. You may make a lot of money trading on momentum, but you also may lose a lot of money. And I didn't put a value on the lawsuit and put that into my future free cash flows because this company is not there to sue other companies. Their main business is to make products and sell them. Although some companies sue companies or get sued and that's just part of business. But maybe in the short term you get lucky and the company sues another company and gets a big windfall of money and your stock goes up. But you can't really bank on that. It's like if you spent 15 years saving money, investing, making sure you invest in the right companies and you grew that to $100,000 and you were really proud of that. Then your friend who doesn't have a career, he never saves money, he's always spending and then one day he gets a $200,000 inheritance so he has more money than you. That doesn't make him a shrewd investor. He got lucky and that's fine but you can't bank on luck. The company's not in business to sue other people that infringe on its patents. There actually are companies that do this. It's called patent trolling. They acquire patents and then they wait for someone to infringe on the patents so they can sue them. And patent trolling is legal. You can acquire patents without any intention of ever selling that product. This is where the stock has been trading the last 12 months. So you can see it was pretty flat for a while. It peaked at 0 0.0065 cents. I know there was a big short squeeze. This must have been the time they did the short squeeze. Also, of course, with the Philip Morris debacle. 
That also helped push the stock price higher. You can see the volume isn't that high, but then it really shoots up. The volume for this stock is off the charts. The stock price is really low, so people can buy a lot of shares. That's part of it. It's really rare for an OTC stock to get this kind of action. I couldn't find many price targets, but this one website had their one year price target at 0.002 cents and their five year at 0.006 cents. And their beta is through the roof. I've never seen a beta even close to this. The stock has gone up 1000% in the past 52 weeks while the S&P 500 went up 37%. The 52 week high was 0.0065 cents. We can't see the 52 week low because of the formatting on Yahoo Finance. The zeros don't go out that far. And the stock is trading below its 50 day and 200 day moving average. Over 700 million shares have been traded on average the past 10 days. That's the highest number I've ever seen. Of the 308 billion shares outstanding, 289 billion are on float. Only 0.14% of the shares are held by institutions and under 1% of the shares are shorted. They do have negative earnings, but in the past five years, their annual earnings increased 25%, much better than its industry in the market. But last year, their earnings went down a lot while their industry in the market went up. The senior management and board members are the biggest shareholders of the company. Then Finemark National Bank, they own 430 million shares. Let's look at their financial ratios. We can't look at the PE because they have negative net income. Their price of sales is 25.4, which is much worse than the market median and average. That means investors are paying $25 for $1 revenue. They also have a really high price to book of 42.1. They have negative operating income, so they have negative ROIC, negative interest coverage ratio, and negative ROE. They do have a lot of current assets relative to their current liabilities. These numbers are from their 331 balance sheet, so they're even better with the rights offering. But according to this, they have $5 million of cash and $57 million of receivables. If you include the $27 million rights offering, the company is well funded for the next few years. The best way to look at ratios to compare them to companies in the same industry. I've done videos of nine companies in the same industry as HCMC. And if HCMC has a number in red, they're worse than the average. If they have a number in blue, they're better than the average. So they're a lot worse than all the price multiples. They have a high current ratio, a negative ROE since they have negative net income. They're doing better in debt than average. And they're by far the smallest company on this list. So to summarize, I have them trading at a 400% premium, but most people aren't investing in this company based off of their fundamentals. They're investing in them because of the Philip Morris lawsuit, or they think this stock price will get pumped up. So although you can make a lot of money if you buy and the stock price gets pushed way higher, the problem is you just don't know when to sell. So if you sell and the stock price doubles and triples after you sell, you get upset. But then if the stock price goes down, you get upset you didn't sell. And you're never really happy because it's impossible to buy at the bottom and sell at the top. But I'm not sure about the future of this company. If they can leverage their vape sales and start selling products all over the country, I think that's the best way to grow the business because the grocery stores is such low margins. So let me know what you think. Give this video a like, subscribe, or comment below. Also, if you'd like to get a custom valuation, or just support the channel, you can become a member by clicking on the link in the description below. Thanks for watching.